and my name is Carrie Nessler, and I am a cadet in the Army ROTC Jayhawk Battalion at the University of Kansas. Here at the Institute, the Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group who members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing Dole sab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Presented by the Department of Military History and the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with the microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerges, the director of the DMH. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, this is a real pleasure, uh, a real treat for us, because we get to uh, introduce an active duty uh, member of our faculty. And I do have to, in all fairness, uh, say that Nate was uh, a member of our faculty in the Department of Military History for three years. Um, and he just this summer transferred up to the Department of Joint Interagency and Multinational Operations. Uh, so we're still going to claim him. Um, he has a, a diverse background uh, as a cavalry armor officer, uh, NATO planner in Afghanistan. Um, he also, he got his master's degree at the University of Texas in Austin, went to West Point as an assistant uh, professor, um, went to the, uh, the Advanced Military Studies program where he got another master's degree. That's the second year program at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, and then has his PhD through the University of Kent, uh, Kent in the UK. Um, he's written on Texas history um, and on the Texas Rangers, and uh, I will now turn you over to Nate Jennings. Uh, thank you, Mark. Appreciate the kind words. Uh, also, thank you to the Dole Institute for inviting me. Getting a little echo here. Uh, as well, um, thank you to all of you for showing up today. Um, we have some cadets here, I understand. Where are you guys at? Yeah, that's great. Uh, any, so first, appreciate uh, the commitment you're showing to a life of service. It's a big deal. Uh, any history majors? I see none. You guys, you guys are smart. You're off to the right track, uh, believe me. Uh, so today, uh, uh, I want to join you to talk about, I'm getting a lot of echo here. Uh, uh, this guy, General Winfield Scott, and his role as the first joint commander in American history. So let's start out with an anecdote here. Let me just ask you, what do you see in this painting? So we have some big ships there, right? That's the US Navy. We have some soldiers being delivered to a beach. That's the Army. If you look in the distance, what do you see? There's a fortress. That's the target. What you're looking at is a representation of the first major joint amphibious operation in US military history. Uh, and I'll go into kind of what those terms mean, what joint means, but this is the first time where the Army and the Navy had to work together in a big way, at scale, in a major operation far from home shores, okay? And that's really what jointness is about. And so what I wanna get into is the role of the commander of this operation. If you look closely, he's right there on uh, the boat with the American flag, General Winfield Scott, probably the most influential US Army officer uh, prior to the Civil War, okay? All right, so just some background definition here. Joint operations. Uh, this is big in our military today. We have a giant building in DC called the Pentagon, 
partially devoted to it. And the definition is quite simple. It's when two or more services uh, are cooperating on a, uh, on a campaign or an operation and working together to achieve a common purpose. Okay, and this is important for the American military in particular because the wars we fight, the campaigns we prosecute are almost all overseas. So it requires all the services, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, to work together to conclude the operation. Uh, no one service in a modern war can be successful on its own. Uh, I'll offer you a quote there from the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Brown. He says, what is essential is jointness. This is the idea of working together, collaborating, partnership, uh, and working seamlessly across all domains, services, as a total force. And in a lot of ways, this describes why the American expedition at Veracruz, which we'll talk about today, is successful. And really, it places General Scott, uh, in my opinion, as the first real joint force commander where he has to think about how to integrate and synchronize all the efforts of all the involved services, not just the army from which he you know, is derived. Okay? Um, right there on, the, on, the, on your left there, you see, really, it's your right, the uh, joint publication. So in modern times, now we have doctrine devoted to describing uh, a, how the services will fight jointly cooperate. Because if you can imagine, if you just get an army general together with his forces, a navy admiral with his fleet, a marine with his forces, and then you just said, hey, figure it out, egos will come into play, perhaps some disagreements, perhaps somebody wants a larger share of the, the recognition. Um, and even if we want to take out personalities, each service has their own way of doing business. And so we have joint doctrine over the top of that with a chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who is the highest ranking flag officer in the nation. And that's, that's this idea of being able to do joint warfare, um, which again is how we do business today. Okay, so some background, because today we're gonna talk about that joint operation at the city of Veracruz, Mexico. But some, the, the road to there uh, was quite difficult. Uh, before the Mexican War, and even after the Mexican War, there is no joint doctrine in the U.S. military. Each service has its own doctrine, its own culture, its own organization, its own priorities, its own kind of business rules, uh, and there's nothing over, superseding all of that to dictate how they should cooperate. For example, if you're delivering Army or Marine soldiers to a shoreline, who's in charge of the landing? Is it the Navy? Is it the Army? Who's in charge of the small, the, uh, the, the, the small boats? At what point on the surf does a land force commander take charge? We have rules now for all of that. We had no, none of that existed uh, in the 19th century. Okay, so in the early Republic, so we're talking pre-1847 right now, we have the U.S. Army as the primary land force, the U.S. Navy as the primary maritime force, and then kind of adjunct to the Navy is the Marine Corps, mostly serving in shipboard detachments. And then also, uh, anyone know what the U.S. Revenue Cutter uh, Service is? Right, that's the precursor to the Coast Guard. Um, and so each of these services, again, has its own doctrine. There's no overriding guide to how they should work together, okay? And to be fair, most of the work they're doing uh, doesn't require a lot of collaboration. If you think about the armies focused inward in the, the frontier or defending the coastline uh, in really contiguous territory, and the Navy's working outwards, you know, into the oceans, okay? All right, so War of 1812. This is important because this is a formative experience for the senior officers who will lead American forces in Mexico, okay? In, 18, in the, you know, the mid-1840s. Uh, hard lessons, some uneven outcomes, uh, some uneven performances. And for the purpose of this discussion, 
the idea of operating jointly is going to be challenged here. There's going to be some successes up in the Great Lakes. You'll have some small expeditions where the Navy and the Army work together. But you also have some inabilities shown, uh, especially the fact that we can't even defend the East Coast. The British will invade and burn the capital. Okay? That's a reflection of an inability to contest the maritime or the, the ocean domain, as well as defend our own coastline, something the Army and the Navy should be working together on, okay? Um, there'll be a little bit of, of jointness down at the Battle of New Orleans, where we have some, the Navy's gonna actually participate in the land battle, so that's an interesting episode. But on the whole, you come out of this war and there's still no real precedent, there's no working understanding of if you're gonna project intercontinental or interregional force, how would this work together? Who's in charge? Uh, is it just up to the commanders to kind of figure things out? Um, and, and so going to the Mexican War, the bottom line, there's still no real precedent for the size and scale of what Winfield Scott and his fellow officers will attempt at Veracruz. Okay, so the man of the hour, this is a guy I find very interesting. Uh, not everyone does, but I do. Um, and he's, as I said, the most influential army officer prior to the Civil War. I think that's a fair statement. Um, he will command the army as an institution from 1841 to 1861, 20 years. Right now, our equivalent army chief of staff gets basically a two to four year stint usually. So think about the profound impact he would have on the institution for being in charge that long. Um, he's a Virginian, born, uh, born and raised at a plantation near Petersburg. He attends William & Mary Law School, decides that's not for him, and ends up joining the Army, and then the War of 1812 will really kickstart his career. He's, he's going to be uh, leading from the front uh, up in the Great Lakes region, um, and he'll be a decorated officer by the end. He'll actually make, actually make uh, Major General Brevet by the end of the war. Um, there's two tensions that really define him in my eyes that are interesting, some polarities. One, uh, one is the public perception of him. So on one hand, he's a bona fide action hero. He leads from the front up, up in the Great Lakes campaigns. He's wounded multiple times. He has horses shot out from under him multiple times. He's captured, paroled, fights again. Uh, and so he gets a public rec reputation for very accurately uh, having battlefield courage, and he's a leader of men. At the same time, anyone know kind of his uh, nickname that he'll develop later in life? Old Fuss and Feathers. He's a martinet who really preens, him, pre you know, preens and polishes his medals and really wants discipline and order, and he loves parades, and he wants that respect. So there's that tension there between the tactical guy, the, the battlefield leader, and the parade soldier that a lot of, a lot of frankly, uh, the younger soldiers do not admire. Um, so that's one tension. And then there's the other aspect of his character. Uh, I would say this guy has problems with everyone he meets. He's a, he's a, a you know, a disagreeable personality in some ways, and he, he'll have feuds with almost every other flag officer in the U.S. Army. The presidents don't like him. Jackson hates him. Polk hates him. Um, and so yet he also has allies in the Congress, and that preserves him. And the tension there is you have this disagreeable guy who ends up getting along famously with the Navy's Commodores when it counts. He's going to have these great partnerships with the home fleet commanders during the Mexican War, and that's going to pay huge dividends. So again, a complicated figure. Um, I would say some, um, uh, some tensions kind of within his personality, within his public persona, but he's a powerful figure in D.C., and his longevity speaks to his skill with political maneuvering. Okay? He will last up until the Civil War, so 1861 is when he retires. That's a picture from, I believe, that year. Uh, and he actually will prove to be far-sighted. He says the Civil War, the Union cannot win in a day in one battle. He actually advises something called the Anaconda Plan. 
isolate, constrict the Confederacy, bifurcate it with the Mississippi River, and squeeze it and win with a more um, uh, approach based on endurance and pressure. Um, and indeed, in some ways, the North will end up adopting his plan later um, once it, they realize uh, you know, the, the set piece battles aren't gonna win. Um, yep, so larger than life figure, I forgot to mention, he's also just a giant among men, literally. He's six foot five, 250 pounds at a time when people are much smaller. So he towers in every room he walks into. And so that's also gonna be an advantage for him uh, in his public life. Okay. Um, all right, so the road to Veracruz. Um, I wanna talk about a little bit about the origins, the start of the Mexican War, the initial campaigns that set up this circumstance where the US military is ordered to conduct a, uh, really a force projection activity, project force down to the coast of Mexico and seize what is probably the most fortified city in the Western Hemisphere, okay? So the Mexican War kicks off in 1846. Uh, it's based initially or uh, off a dispute over over the border of Texas. The US annexes Texas, says that the US government then an inherits the Texan claim that their, their southern border is actually the Rio Grande. Mexico disputes this, says it's a little farther north. And so it, it ends up being an issue that will only be decided by war. Uh, the Polk administration also is openly expansionist. They wanna push the borders all the way to the west coast and that's a platform item for the Polk administration. And so really picking the fight over Texas is also a pretext to try to force the issue on California. And they will also end up take, uh, negotiating uh, Oregon with the British Empire. Um, so basically the road to war, President Polk is gonna push a field army under General Zachary Taylor down to the Rio Grande. That is a provocative move that Mexico cannot tolerate, so they're gonna push their army to the north, also to the Rio Grande, and war is pretty much inevitable at that point. You have some skirmishes, but then very quickly, General Zachary Taylor is gonna get a string of battlefield victories in the Rio Grande Theater and really secure Texas and the inherited claims. At the same time, the, the uh, US Army is gonna send a regiment of dragoons really from Fort Leavenworth, where I work, all the way to the California coast, talk about an epic ride, a lot of their horses will die. They will arrive there, join a Navy contingent on land, so a joint, a joint force is created, and they're gonna have a, kind of a running series of battles with the Californios, this, the, the Mexican Presidio soldiers, uh, and eventually they will win California. These are very small engagements, we're talking about small forces involved, but on the frontier in these kind of uh, vast areas, small forces have strategic outcomes. So by the end of 1846, uh, you have a string of US garrisons from San Diego over to Santa Fe, along the Rio Grande and down to Brownsville. And the US is sitting on this territory. It's occupied it militarily uh, and they have a problem. The Mexican government is refusing to concede. Um, the U.S. is actually offering to buy the land for $30 million, but no Mexican politician could ever entertain that idea and remain politically viable in their own country. So they just refuse to talk, and they're kind of at an impasse. Um, at that point, the Mexican army will attempt a counteroffensive. Uh, President Santa Ana will lead an army north in an attempt to um, reverse the outcomes in the Rio Grande Theater, where he will be defeated at the Battle of Buena Vista, probably the most important land battle of the war. Um, and of note, Taylor wins, the, wins that fight with largely a volunteer force because the regulars have been diverted over to Scott towards the Gulf of Mexico to attempt a Veracruz landing, okay? But even after Buena Vista, the Mexicans have lost pretty much every major, major battle. They're still refusing to come to the table. And so Scott, President Polk, the secretaries, they kind of come up with this idea, it's gonna take something more decisive, and they decide that it, a littoral invasion at Veracruz and then a march on Mexico City uh, is probably the only way to force the concessions we want. 
Um, again, this is kind of an amoral approach. This is dog eat dog. Um, and indeed, the U.S. will be condemned in many quarters for beating up on a smaller neighbor. But also, this is just, uh, this is war between nation states. So if you look at the map here, you can see the blue lines coming down from New Orleans down to Veracruz along the coastline. What becomes obvious is this is going to be a joint venture. The army could march down from, from, the tech, from the Rio Grande straight south to Mexico City, but it is a hot, very arid, I don't want to say desolate, there is people there, but no supply for an army. So it's not a, it, it is a challenging route to do a land invasion. And that leads you to a naval, a naval invasion with an amphibious assault. And Veracruz is really the only spot. That's where the road to Mexico City starts. It's the entry point into Mexico to the wider world. So if they take that city, then Scott can, again, march straight inland, by the way, along the route that Cortez took, same route, and either force a battle, threaten the city, occupy the city, the capital, find a way to force the Mexicans to um, agree to terms advantageous to the United States. Okay. Uh, so the, the game is now set for this massive amphibious assault, which the U.S. military has never even attempted before. All right, so Veracruz, let's talk about the target here. It's a city of about 15,000 civilians, has a garrison of 4,000 soldiers. There's a large international presence there. This is the gateway to Mexico, so diplomats, uh, uh, commercial people, um, and, and so it's a, it's a thriving, busy city, and most importantly, it's well fortified. The entire city is surrounded by walls, but what's really interesting is if you see off the coast here, there's an island with a star fort castle up, uh, facing Veracruz, so if you imagine there's now a, kind of a slot of water in between, but the point is you have interlocking fields of fire, fire from the fort and the island castle overwatching any approach to the city. The U.S. Navy conducts a reconnaissance early in the war and says it would be very costly to take, this, particularly the castle, which is the lower picture there, to take that by storm would be immensely costly in ships and men, so they kind of take it off the table. Um, again, probably the most well-fortified, imposing city in the Western Hemisphere, uh, and with a, a large garrison and, and a decent supply of ammo, supplies. In, uh, in the castle there, a hundred guns, a thousand men. Even during the fight when they actually attack it, this, thing, this, this will remain impregnable. They will never capture that by storm. It'll just end up surrendering. Okay? Um, and again, just to recap, you see the circle there on the map, that's Veracruz, the star is Mexico City. You have to take the port in order to have an, uh, uh, an ingress route to march on the, the enemy capital. So one thing leads to another. All right, so some of the, the characters involved here. We've talked about Winfield Scott. He's the commander of the army, so he's the institutional commander in DC. Now he's gonna take that hat on and put on a field commander hat and lead a field army on campaign, something that wouldn't happen now but you know, it's kind of his, his prerogative there. He wasn't President Polk's first choice, by the way, because of political reasons. Um, and after exhausting all his options, he turns to Scott, who he does not like, and says, I guess you'll lead the expedition. Scott knows it's his moment. Uh, the guy on the right, on my right, is uh, Commodore David Connor. He's the home fleet commander for the US Navy, and he will be the operational uh, maritime uh, commander for the armada that will sail to Veracruz and assault it. Um, so if we wanted to use modern terms, I hope this doesn't bore you, we would say Scott is the joint force commander. He's in charge of both all elements involved, army, navy, there's some marines. He's in charge of everything, not by any specified rule or, I don't, or even really direction from the president because of his seniority, his eminent personality. Um, and then we would say Connor is the maritime component commander. He's in charge of everything happening on the water, but answers to Scott. So if we have a joint force commander, a maritime commander, we're still missing 
the land component commander. Who's in charge of the soldiers when they're on land? It's going to be Scott. He's going to wear both of those hats, dual responsibilities. Um, we would not do that now, preferably, right? That's a lot of responsibility for one guy to have. Uh, we would rather have, you know, a commander in the land, a commander in the ocean, all reporting to one joint force commander. But in his time, Scott's going to going to do it all. Okay, so these two men will develop a remarkable partnership. By the way, Connor, very interesting person. He's a Pennsylvanian. He's he fights in the Navy in the War of 1812, and he's actually wounded in ship on ship combat. And then he, because he's, he's just very good, he rises through the ranks. And just because of timing, he's the home fleet commander when it's time to do this invasion. So instead of you know, uh, assigning a subordinate fleet commander, he just leads the armada himself. It's going to be about 200 ships under, uh, not all under his command. The, ar the transports are under army command. They're, Scott retains ownership of those. But he's effectively the fleet commander. Okay? And... I guess one of the takeaways here is they have to develop ad hoc cooperation. Again, no doctrine, no rules, no guidelines, just these two men getting together, making a plan, figuring out when, when and how they're going to hand off responsibilities, how they're going to synchronize efforts between the Navy and the Army, and, uh, and it's really a model cooperation. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at what Scott says in his first letter to Connor. Associated in joint operations. That's interesting. He's using the term joint correctly, even though it's not doctrine yet. Right? That's a very modern term, but he uses it correctly the way we would use it. He says, I shall do all in my power to render the combined service cordial and effective. And remember, this is a time when generals husband power and re reputation to themselves, right? You want to be the commander in the field so you can get your name in the newspapers, in the battle reports, get that public recognition, which ends up being political currency for a lot of these guys. Um, and here he's offering to share that with someone in a different institution that's often, by the way, a funding competitor, right? In the negotiations in D.C. over service equities and things like that. So, uh, you know, he says at the end, uh, hoping to hear from you often in reply, all, all matters interesting to the common service. So he's already setting the tone from the beginning. This is going to be a team effort. We're doing this together. And I'm just telling you, that's not that common in the 18th, 19th century when commanders are zealous for renown uh, and want, want the recognition. And, frankly, just the human impulse for, for control. Okay, so let's phase this operation. I'm going to go through four phases to describe how these, uh, the U.S. military, with a joint operation, uh, takes down this uh, imposing Mexican fort. Uh, so the first phase is the naval blockade. That's actually been ongoing for more than a year. Uh, but also joint planning. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a staging base uh, a little bit to the south of Veracruz where they're going to unite their ships. And Scott and Connor are going to get on one ship. It's a steamer. Uh, the subordinate army generals will also join them. And then Scott's personal staff will join him. It's kind of interesting that part of uh, some key members of Scott's staff are a bunch of very young engineers, army engineers, why? Because they, they're very useful in reconnaissance and planning because they understand terrain, uh, fortifications, earthworks, and they can correctly ascertain how best to counter those, those obstacles. So we're going to have some uh, future famous people such as Robert E. Lee is on the ship, Joe Johnston, we have Beauregard, I think Meade is there. Um, by the way, in the Army, Ulysses Grant, um, a lot of the Civil War greats, they're here with Scott as junior officers. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, so the point is that they do a joint reconnaissance. That alone wouldn't happen in a lot of campaigns. And so they sail up, they take a look at the, the Mexican layout, uh, where they're strong, where they're weak, and they decide, no, uh, salting directly is not going to work too costly. Um, and by the way, Scott has a purpose 
a reason he can't do that. The real obstacle is to come. Taking Veracruz is just the first step. He knows Santa Ana is forming another field army in the interior. So he has to take the fort and still have a viable army with enough combat power to go take, defeat Santa Ana in a set piece battle. He knows that's coming. Then he has to march and take another even uh, almost equally fortified city, and that's, that's the capital, Mexico City, okay? So he has to, you know, figure out a way to do this w while avoiding a lot of attrition. And so what they're going to decide is if you look, you have the blue arrows, that's the Navy blockade. The green arrow there, there's a beach just to the south of the city that's open, and it's a great landing spot. So they decide we're going to land there, and then we'll see what our options are, probably do a siege of the city instead of assaulting it directly. Okay, so that's a good way to, to defeat the, the Mexican garrison without taking a lot of losses. But Scott also has another problem. He has to do this quickly. The yellow fever season is coming, so that's around April, May. A, the weather conditions change and a lot, the soldiers will get sick. So he needs to finish this and get up onto the Mexican plateau as soon as possible. Also, I mentioned Santa Ana's forming that field army, another one. A worst case scenario is Scott is decisively engaged on Veracruz and that other army shows up and attacks him from behind. So he needs to get this done, package his army and march off west to, to take on the next challenge. And he's got to do it quickly, but he's also got to do it without taking a lot of losses. That's a tall order for any commander, by the way. Okay, phase two, the actual landings. So this is another aspect where you're going to see some joint cooperation come in. I told you Scott, per, Scott, as the army commander, owns all the transports with all the soldiers on them. Those are actually owned by the army. Same with the landing craft, which are specially ordered and designed for this, this operation. But after some consultation with Connor, he's going to hand over all responsibility for the tran transference of the soldiers from ship to shore. He's going to give that to the Navy. And a little bit of humility, he's going to recognize they, they, this is their terrain, actually. They got it. And he's going to let naval officers man the, the, um, the landing craft. He's going to let the Commodore handle the shipping of the soldiers from the staging base to the proximity to the beach. Um, so this is, again, an, uh, some joint negotiation going on where, where Scott's going to give a little bit of this control up. And, you know, as, again, outsized personality. He's used to being in charge. And so it's actually a big deal for him to give up some of this control. And it works quite well. Another aspect, there's going to be something called the Mosquito Fleet. This is a bunch of gunboats, small boats, that will provide a screen. You can't see them on the, on the, on the TV here. But they're going to move up near the shoreline and provide covering fire for the landing. Um, it is uncontested. That's Scott's worry that the Mexicans will contest the landing. They do not. They have cavalry on the beach, and so the covering fire will disperse that cavalry and allow an uncontested landing, which is a huge luxury. Um, so in about five hours, they'll land 9,000 soldiers without a single fatality. This is, this is a, a, a huge achievement, I would argue, in this kind of amphibious operation, and they will establish and build out the lodgment. Uh, in case anyone's wondering, the first regiment ashore is the U.S. 6th Infantry Regiment. They sprint up the beach, get their colors in the dunes, and they claim that honor of being the first, and that's a big deal uh, amongst the, uh, the Army. Okay, so another example of joint cooperation. All right, phase three is where things get wild. This is the bombardment. So Scott offers, asks the city to surrender. They refuse. And so he's going to extend a siege around the landward side of, the, 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 uh, of Veracruz and cut Veracruz off uh, with this chain of posts and dug in positions, cut them off from the rest of Mexico, right? All their, you know, from reinforcements, supply, everything in the Mexican interior they might need, he's going to isolate them from. And then he's going to offer them to surrender. They say no. And he's basically going to open up a horrific cannonade for 48 hours, and he is going to attack the walls somewhat. It's mostly going into the center of the city. This is, ter this is a prelude to terror bombing. He's killing civilians, wreaking havoc, both from the land and the sea, with 
army and navy cannons, and he's trying to force them to surrender without an assault, without a, a charge against the walls. Okay, here we go. There's a map showing a little bit of the laydown. You have the dotted line. That's the army divisions and brigades that are uh, uh, laying siege and isolating. Out in the blue, we'd have the armada positioning uh, for cannonade. And then if you look right here, just south of the city, there's two land batteries, okay? The one on the right is the army batteries. They're gonna build these out. But the army actually doesn't get a lot of the cannon it was supposed to bring with it. They just don't arrive in time. And its guns are pretty small. If you think about it, the army needs guns that can be towed by horses pretty quickly with the army to, right, to maneuver uh, for the, for the set-piece battles that are coming. So Scott's going to ask the Navy, well, why don't you bring some of your big guns ashore? This is a wild idea. And the Navy's going to say, yeah, we can do that, but our guys are going to be the gun crews. Okay, so there's a negotiation happening, and that's what you see right there on the left. The, the battery to the left um, is called the naval battery because they're naval guns, naval crews dug in into kind of an army gun emplacement. Um, the engineer officer who will be responsible for constructing the um, position is going to be Robert Lee. Okay, so he's getting his first experiences here in combat. Actually, he's He's already fought in the, uh, the Rio Grande campaign, um, but he's showing his value as an engineer. So again, when everything's ready, Scott gives, asks for the surrender, they say no. He commences a 48-hour bombardment from land and sea. It is intense. Probably more than 300 civilians die. Um, at one point, the, uh, uh, the message is sent out, well, will you let the foreigners leave? Uh, you know, there's all these French and British people in there. And guess what he says? He says, no, you had your chance. They say, will you let the women and children leave? He says, no, I'll take only surrender. Unconditional surrender, actually. Um, and eventually, at the end of the 48, you know, four days, that commander will surrender unconditionally. Um, and Scott is generous. He will parole their, their prisoners. I want to talk about the negotiation. So this is a point where certainly the army would own the the talks, own the surrender, army's gonna occupy the city. But Scott does something I think fairly novel, is he, he assigns first for the talks, for the negotiations, an, uh, a one-star general and a Navy captain together to go do the negotiation. So he's bringing the Navy in, into this. And then at the signing, the surrender of the city, he's gonna bring the Commodore in, and together they both sign the surrender document. So he, this army general is effectively sharing the glory, the, um, the credit uh, with this Navy Commodore, and that's going to be reflected in the battle reports, in the newspapers back home. Uh, and so this, this is him, again, sh developing that joint relationship. And a little bit of it is practical, because the war doesn't end with this surrender. He now has a field army in Mexico that's utterly reliant on the Navy's resupply. Right? The Navy has to bring food, spare weapons, ammo, everything from New Orleans down to, uh, to Veracruz. And so this cultivation of this joint relationship is going to pay more dividends, okay? So that's, that's the, four, the, the, the phase sequencing, how this joint relationship, this joint cooperation, uh, really allows the American forces to capture the city with minimal losses at a heavy cost for the Mexicans, we should acknowledge, okay? All right, so let's talk theater logistics. Three minutes, okay. Um, so this is where another aspect of the jointness comes in. I said the field army has to be supplied, uh, and you're gonna end up, as Scott marches in, a combination of land supply lines and naval supply lines working together. So really from Philadelphia down to New Orleans, over to Texas, then down to Tampico, you can see the city midway down, and then to Veracruz, that's all the Navy's responsibility. And then the Army wagons, you see that lower picture, are gonna pick up those supplies and kind of tow them in, inland to catch up with the Army wherever it is during the advance on Mexico City, and then even afterwards, okay? So again, this joint relationship really is, is what's making theater logistics 
the eater level supply possible. I'm running short on time here, but the advance to Mexico City, that's also joint. Um, as Scott is approaching the capital for the final climactic battle, guess who shows up to join the fight? The Marine Corps. They will send an infantry battalion to Veracruz. It will march fast, catch up to Scott in time for the final fight, and that's how we get the, the halls of Montezuma in their famous song. Okay, so even the assault on Mexico City is joint, and Scott praises them in his writings. So this joint endurance, this ability to not only seize, to fight, but to persevere in what becomes an occupation of Mexico results in strategic pressure on the Mexican leadership. The message is clear. We're not leaving until you decide to sell half of your land, okay, under pressure. And that's uh, exactly what will happen. All right, so outcomes. In many ways, this joint operation with Winfield Scott as the joint commander, uh, really an ad hoc affair, improvised, uh, without doctrine, without precedent, I would say it, it establishes a cornerstone of the American way of war. And that's this idea of expeditionary joint operations under one joint commander, where all the services have to work together to achieve objectives. Um, California's a contrast, I told you. They work together in some of the fights, the, the army forces, the navy forces off near, um, really uh, near San Diego and marching up to LA. Um, but they fall into serious acrimony because after the fighting's done, both the navy and the army think they're in charge and wanna basically do military uh, governance of the province a new province, and it's gonna take an order from DC to say no, Army's in charge on land, Navy has the port, and they almost come to blows over it, okay? Uh, the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, so this is definitely unfair to Mexico, but the US will buy half of its land for $15 million, that's less than half the price Polk offered before the war, okay? And yes, there is a moment where the all Mexico political movement looks like it might get its way in annex the entire country. But instead, they kind of draw the line at the Rio Grande and then take the border straight over to California. Uh, Civil War, we talked about this, uh, this approach, Scott's approach to joint operations, really a systems approach, looking at the enemy as a series of um, kind of power centers and agents that can be separated. Um, he'll apply this to the Civil War, he'll come up with the Anaconda Plan. No one will listen to him, including Lincoln but they'll come around to it about third, fourth year of the war when it, they realize it's not gonna be won with a battle. Uh, I said Lee, Grant, McClellan, these guys are all there as captains and lieutenants, and they learn from Scott powerful lessons about how to, how to campaign. Some of them will not be helpful. They're gonna learn, what they're gonna take away from Mexico is offense wins, the attacker has the initiative, maneuver will defeat defenses, and, none, and that's gonna all be problematic, fast forwarding 20 years to the Civil War when the weaponry is more lethal. And so some hard lessons will have to be unlearned that worked in Mexico. Uh, and finally, again, this joint venture with this, I would, I would say, inspired joint commander uh, really sets a cornerstone, uh, a, a primary aspect of the American way of war where joint forces conduct expeditionary intercontinental operations to achieve strategic objectives. And we're gonna see that again, in the, in the, in some in the Civil War, but really in the, in the Spanish War of 1898, World War I and II by definition, okay? And then on to today when it's now codified in doctrine as our normal operating business. Right, so I'll leave you with this, Winfield Scott, the, I would consider the architect of American joint warfare. If you go to West Point, you can see his grave. It's actually right next to the subway and the gym, so you can work out, grab a healthy meal, spend some time with Scott. Um, I have done those in that order. Uh, and then also, that overpass there, he has a small fort named after him near San Francisco, part of a presidio, and those are kind of two, uh, two of his legacy items. We also have this statue of him in DC. 
Uh, for further works, I'll just leave this up. I'm not gonna go through them, but you can reference the video. Uh, if you wanna see, um, do, do some further reading on Veracruz and Scott's role in it. And I'll just tee up for next time. We got Dr. John Hosler, incredible professor. He's gonna be coming here to talk about Henry II. And that concludes my presentation and I'll take your questions. Anaconda plan. Can you give an example or two? Of yeah, so he Henry's wanted a naval war. blockade of the entire Confederacy. He wanted what ends up happening, forces to march down the Mississippi and control that entire avenue, therefore bifurcating, separating the two halves of the South, and then constrict it, right? Industrial nation states require industrial inputs, international commerce, especially in an agra agrarian society like the South that lacks the industry of the North. Um, and then pursue some advantageous large-scale battles when ready. He said in 1861, he told Lincoln, the army's not ready. And they sent it in anyways, and you get bull run. Uh, I have a, uh, I have a uh, small question, uh, which uh, you mentioned that uh, Winfield Scott uh, studied uh, law at William and Mary, and then had a successful career in the military. And uh, the question, if you, if you know this, is uh, whether there was any intermediate military training or experience uh, between those two things. Did he go to West Point? Did he go to VMI? Or was there some kind of mediating? No, uh, he did not experience? attend an academy that I know of. West Point isn't even a, a thing yet at that point. Um, he does get some early, he serves in a militia for about a year in Virginia, uh, and then he'll commission, um, and then, you know, he's a young man, he wants to serve, and then the War of 1812 kicks off, and that's where he's going to really, you know, that's going to catapult his career, but I don't, I don't know of any formal academy that he attended. Um, you know, they would have had training programs for new officers, new militia officers, so he, I'm sure he received some of that training. In the uh, decade or so before the war with Mexico, was there any equivalent, however rough, of a war plan orange? Um, I don't believe so. If, if anything, it would be against the British. Um, I don't know of a, a, a rainbow series or anything like that. Um, and remember, the army's focused on Indian wars and constabulary operations. When it fights in Mexico, most of those soldiers have never been with their entire battalion before, or only at a previous staging base, right? Uh, I have a student studying the 3rd Infantry Regiment's role in this war. They're dispersed in Florida doing counter Indian operations. The first time all 10 companies are together is in St. Louis when they muster, and then they march down to Corpus Christi, and the first time you have more than a brigade together is, sem is Taylor assembling his field army. So on the fly, they're learning how to do large-scale fire and maneuver. Yeah. Um, what would be the background for uh, him to conceive combined operations? So Scott was a voracious reader. He has some practical experience in, up in, in the, uh, the Great Lakes campaigns of 1812, and he does work with the Navy. It's a much smaller scale smaller bodies of water, um, but when I mention reading because he reads a lot about the Napoleonic Wars. Um, you know, by 1815, those are over, uh, and so we know he's reading about pretty much everything that happened with Napoleon and his generals, the generals opposing him, and in particular, he's going to read about counter guerrilla and pacification theory, and he explicitly will read what it, about what happened to the French in Spain, and how things spiraled because of the enmity of the popula population, the enmity of the church. And he, while occupying Mexico, will do the exact opposite. Just give you one tiny example. He brings chests of gold with him as he's marching inland. And every town they stop in, he has rules about, prohibits the soldiers to steal, plunder, none of that. 
and they buy off the local economy, and that both lessens his supply chain, but also everywhere they go, the peasantry in Mexico become fairly prosperous. You know, imagine being the ranchers and farmers in every army outpost. Now you got a, a regular customer paying in gold. So that's one example he learned from, uh, from the French experience. Hi, I'd like to, uh, you had that uh, drawing showing the landing. Yeah, I can go back to that. Yes, that one. Uh, Oop. Yes, yeah. There's a delay. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the, I'm wondering where this uh, would have been, uh, would have taken place because when you show on the map where they land, mm -hmm. they land south of the uh, fortress and south of the city mm -hmm. so that the fortress should have been on their right, but in this picture, it's on their left. Yeah. Um, take it up with the painter. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. I just... <laughs> That's good. A good pick. It seems like uh, leadership is a big part of this story, but as you uh, talked about this, the, the logistics is huge. Mm -hmm. Did we, how did we develop the logistical capabilities leading up to this time? Yeah, so one of the unsung heroes of this war is a guy named General Jessup. He's the quartermaster uh, general for the U.S. Army, and he's going to just work tirelessly to sustain the entire war, both from D.C., then he'll move down to uh, New Orleans. There's going to be a chain of supply magazines and depots throughout. He has to procure everything from new ships to uniforms to making the, they have to order all the uh, landing craft, um, about 100 of them. Uh, only 67 will make it down there. Um, but yes, so that's, that's going on in, in the background and he gets no credit. And I will say, in the first year of the war, Scott has a big hand in that because um, he's you know, basically an administrator up in DC. I have another small question uh, since you mentioned the landing craft and uh, that is whether you happen to know anything about the specs of these uh, landing craft. Are they different from uh, other, other vessels uh, in use at the time? And uh, do they move under their own power from uh, the US coast, I don't know, uh, New Orleans or wherever to Veracruz? Sure, uh, they're about 40 feet long. They're made to kind of fit together like a shell so you can stack them on a ship. And they're specially ordered for this operation. I don't know if there's any models from other, arm, other armies or navies they're looking at. Um, but Scott personally special orders these from a firm in Philadelphia who produces them very quickly, uh, surprisingly quickly. Um, and they will be just stacked on these ships and then eventually towed to the site of the offloading of soldiers adjacent to the shore. Um, Again, if you look at the picture, you have naval officers uh, commanding each of the landing craft. A, a platoon of 40 men, it, they're supposed to fit a platoon of 40 men in each one. And this is a great design to keep contiguous units delivered at the, at the surf. All right, um, I think that takes us to the end, everyone. I appreciate all of you coming out. It's an honor to join you. Um, and next time you look at a, you know, see a picture of the Pentagon or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs on TV, think about Winfield, Winfield Scott, who set the precedent for uh, the way we operate now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>